Hey everyone and welcome back to The Leadership Project with your host Mick Spears. We bring you thought-provoking guests and topics every week to challenge your thinking about leadership. Our aim is to help you become the leader that you wish you always had as we learn together and lead together. Hey everyone and welcome back to The Leadership Project with your host Mick Spears. We bring you thought-provoking guests and topics every week to challenge your thinking about leadership. Our aim is to help you become the leader that you wish you always had as we learn together and lead together. Today's episode was brought to you by BNI, the world's largest referral networking organisation. You can become part of a local network with global reach. BNI is the largest and most successful business networking organisation with members and chapters in over 76 countries. With BNI, it's more than just helping you grow your business, it is helping you build your network and to give you that supportive environment that you need to help you through the tough times and the good times. So if you'd like to know more about BNI, please go to bni.com and reach out to your local chapter. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Leadership Project. I'm deeply honoured today to be joined by Dr. Ivan Meisner. Dr. Ivan is the founder and chief visionary officer of BNI, the world's largest business networking organisation with more than 10,000 chapters worldwide and chapters on every occupied continent on the planet. He's also a New York Times bestselling author and the author of 28 books, including his latest offering, Who's in Your Room, which is an intriguing title that we may get some time to talk about later. But without any further ado, Ivan, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Can you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what led you to create BNI in the first place. Well, thanks for having me on your podcast. I really appreciate it. Regarding BNI, you know, I'd like to tell you I had this vision of an international organization, but the truth is I needed some referrals for my consulting practice. I was a management consultant. I was young. I was looking for business and I put together some people that I trusted. They trusted me and we agreed to refer each other. Someone came to that first group who couldn't join because we, uh, from the beginning, only took one person her professional classification. And she said, this is really great. I could get a ton of business out of a group like this. Would you help me open up my own group? And I said, no, this isn't what I do. I'm a business consultant. I don't run a network. She said, look, this is kind of consulting. You know, you're helping me build my business. Like, yeah, it's a really a stretch, but okay. So we opened a second group and uh, we had a couple dozen people come. Two couldn't join because of a conflict in their classification. And both of them said, this is great. I could get a ton of business. Would you help me open up my own group? And I said, no, this, this isn't what I do. And uh, they talked me into it and we opened those groups. And it, it was just then, you know, the, the gates were open and the horses ran. Ended up opening 20 chapters in the first year by accident. Uh, I mean, I really didn't have a plan to do that. And it wasn't until the end of the first year that I really um, saw the, the, what this could be and that it could be really huge. I, I, I call it my uh, Brody moment. Do you remember the movie Jaws? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. And at the end, Sharon Brody is throwing some chum out into the ocean. And for the first time, you really see the shark and comes up and 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 he's shocked at how big it is. And he turns around to the ship's captain and he says, you're going to need a bigger boat. Yeah, I remember that. Oh, and and that's when I realized I'm going to need a bigger boat. This is going to be way bigger than I anticipated. And we now have over 10,000 chapters all around the world. So it's a very happy accident, I've got to say. And I've seen BNI yeah. meetings in progress and they're very powerful in terms of what they do. And we'll probably come to some of that later. The few interesting things there, Ivan, I want to do on the first one is a lot of people are out there looking for their purpose. And sometimes your purpose is knocking on the door and you're not realizing that, it's, that you should answer that door. So, you know, if, if people are asking you the same question, over and over again. And you're saying, but that's not what I do. I'm a business consultant. Yeah. But eventually you answered that call and, and here we are today. Tell us more about what was going through your mind at that point. What, like, was it questioning, you know, what is this all about? Why, why is this happening? 
what happened, what shifted inside Ivan at that point? What, what shifted was, you know, I was, I was a management consultant. I, I was really gearing up my consulting business. And at first, this was kind of a distraction. But it was, in fact, a way of helping more people. And what I realized at the end of the year was that this could be much larger and I could end up really working with and helping more people than as a consultant where, you know, you basically I can work with eight to 12 clients at a time at the most. But with BNI, we now have, you know, 292,000 members worldwide. And so I, I realized that this could be much bigger and I could help a, a whole lot more people. And that was really the bottom line for me was, yeah, I, I think I can do more for more people. So I'm hearing two things there, Ivan. One is the multiplication of impact and then yeah. that desire inside you to help other people, which I think really comes through when we talk about the values of BNI and giver's gain, which we'll, we'll get to uh, later. Yeah, our principal core value, giver's gain. Yeah, yeah, very good. Now, you said two other things at the start. You said the word referral and you said yeah. the word trust. What makes those two words important in the way BNI works? When you give a referral, you give a little bit of your reputation away. So if you give a good referral, it enhances your reputation. If you give a bad referral, it hurts your reputation. And so there really needs to be a level of trust before you can give referrals to people. If you if, if, if you want to keep the relationships you have, there's got to be some trust. Now, it, it's important to understand something that I talk about in a couple of my books, the time confidence curve that no matter what business you're in, it takes a certain amount of time before people have confidence in your ability to provide a quality product or service. Mm. The time confidence curve is shorter for a florist than it is for a printer, than it is for a real estate agent, than it is for a financial planner who invests your retirement. Time confidence curve is very long for the financial planner. And so you have to understand the time confidence curve because it, it, it takes more time to develop the level of trust you need to develop to, to get referrals as a financial planner than it does as a florist. And once you recognize that and you recognize that it is all about trust, uh, then, then you're off to the races. It's about building those relationships. Uh, and I think a lot of people don't get it. They, they, they use networking as a face-to-face -face cold call. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name's Ivan. Let's do business. And they go right into uh, trying to sell as opposed to building relationships and trust. Yeah. So it's the power then of, I guess, third party trust is going to shorten that curve that you're talking about, that time confidence curve. That's a really interesting concept you're talking there, but it needs to be built on something. It needs to be built that relationship. Tell us about the power of relationships. Well, I think when it comes to networking, you have to understand that networking is more about farming than it is about hunting. It's about cultivating relationships with other business professionals. <clears throat> One of the things that I teach that I think is really important is what I call the VCP process. It stands for visibility, credibility, profitability. First, you have to be visible. People have to know who you are and what you do. And then you have to establish credibility. And that's the one that takes time. Establishing credibility is a long-term process. But you go from visibility, where people know who you are and what you do, to credibility, where people know who you are, they know what you do, and then they know you're good at it because you've built a, a trust over time with them. And then and only then can you get to profitability, where people know who you are, they know what you do, they know you're good at it, and they're willing to give you referrals on an ongoing basis. Where networking goes wrong and where people hate networking is when they go to a networking event and someone tries to jump over visibility over credibility and get right to profitability. In one of my books, I call that premature solicitation, which you don't want to say fast three times, it'll get you in trouble. And it's, it, you know, it's, it's really where you're at, at a fourth phase that I haven't mentioned, which is invisibility. And you're just trying to get right down to doing business, but there's no trust. There's no credibility. And that's why some people hate networking because people use it as that face-to-face -face cold call. So visibility and credibility need to come before you start striving for some kind of business and some kind of yep. profitability. Yeah, you know, you know that old expression, it's, it's, it never hurts to ask? Yeah, right. It Dead does. wrong. Does. Totally it does. wrong. It does if you've missed the first two steps. Yeah. Right. That's correct. Now, okay. when you're at the third, when, you, when, you're, when you're really solid at credibility, it, then it doesn't hurt to ask. Yeah. then it's okay to ask because you're at credibility, strong credibility. Okay. All right. I think we'll come back to visibility and credibility in a moment. I think it's a key 
self-esteem. The other part that I've heard you talk about in these relationships is to make sure it is relational, not transactional. Tell us what those two terms mean to you, Ivan. Well, one of the books I did was about the difference between men and women and how they network. And we found that men on average were more likely to be transactional in the way they networked than women were. And women were much more likely to be relational in the way they networked. And interestingly enough, the, the women, uh, in it was a study of 12,000 people all over the world, 12,000, and not just BNI members, it was open to the public. And we found that women were more likely to uh, get a higher percentage of their business through networking and through referrals than men were. But they were also more likely to be relational than men were. So we thought that was very interesting. So we took gender out of it completely and just looked at rel- relational versus transactional. And we found that men and women who were more relational in the way they network uh, got a higher percentage of their business through networking than those who were transactional in the way they were networking. And by transactional, I mean, hey, we're here to do business. You know, mm. and then you get right into the transaction. I'll give you an example. The difference between men and women, transactional, relational. I'm having a conversation with a man and a woman. And a fourth person comes in as a, a, a second woman. And she she comes up and the, the first woman says, hi, what's your name? And they introduced each other. And she said, hi, rather than what do you do? She said, how did you hear about tonight's event? Mm-hmm. And the second woman said, oh, my friend Sally invited me to the event. The first woman was like, oh, my goodness, Sally, you know, Sally, I know Sally, too. How do you know, Sally? And now they're talking about Sally. I look over at the guy. The guy's like rolling his eyes back, like, you know. Kill me now. Who cares about Sally? <laughs> I'm here to do business. And I could see he was just going nuts that these two ladies are talking about some other person who's not even there. But that was a relational connection. Hmm. And he was there for the transactional connection. They were there for the relational connection. And what we found in this book and this study that we did was that those people who take a relational approach to networking are, are much more successful. So what I'm hearing here is making sure that we don't bypass the know and like, right? So we want, yeah. we want to build trust with people and we want to do business with people that we know, like, and trust, but you can't exactly. skip those first two. And if I can play back that story that you're just talking about, what I'm hearing there is someone that was curious and looking to be interested, not interesting. So find out about yeah. that other person and try and find some kind of connection. Yeah, that's the key is it being interested more than interesting. A good networker has two ears and one mouth and should use them both proportionately. Yeah. All right. So you, you touched on this before as well, Ivan. There are some people out there. I, I know I'm going to say tens or hundreds of people that would be like this. We say, oh, there's a networking event this Thursday night. You want to come? And their initial reaction is, ah because of some of this background of yeah. people being transactional, et cetera. What advice can you give to people that have tried networking in the past? It didn't work for them. They didn't like it. They didn't enjoy it. It was their worst time of their life. How do we encourage them that there can be a better way and go out there and try again? Well, we all hear about the people that say they don't like networking. However, uh, when I did the study of 12,000 people, 91.4% of the respondents said that they'd had success through networking. That, that networking has helped them be successful. Okay. 91%. When have you ever seen 91% of any group of people agree to anything ever? So I think it's, I, I don't think it's quite the majority that we think. I think it's a loud minority that say they don't like networking. And, and I think it's new people in business who don't really understand how to do it. So let me talk to them. And I don't think they're the majority. The, the key there is, as you said, to be interested, not necessarily trying to be interesting. And if you, it, you know, it's about making that connection with somebody and finding out information about that person. And so when you go to networking events, ask questions. Don't try to close sales. What happens is people try to, you know, they're, pa- they're like a card dealer. They're passing out their cards and it's very transactional and, and, and they're connecting with other people that are transactional and it's not working for them because they're not being relational. They're not asking questions, getting information. You ask questions and, 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 and actually have a conversation with somebody. It's interesting. It's interesting to meet other people in other professions and to have conversations with them. So you have to go into these networking events with the right attitude. 
You also have to know what to look for when you go into a room. For example, you, you want to be able to, 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 to read a room and know where to start conversations. Let me explain. Hmm. When, when you, it, so let's say you have the God view, you're looking down on the room. If you have two people who are standing like this, you're not going to break into that conversation very easily. They're standing you know, perpendicular to each other and they're not going to, it's hard to break into that conversation. What you want to look for are open twos. People that are, again, looking down, they're standing askew like this so that you can step on in or an open three, which would look like a U. Uh, we have three people standing there so you can slip in or an open group, like a huddle, but there's, there's an open spot where you can slip in. Uh, don't try to break into closed twos, closed threes, closed fours, which would look like a square. Don't try to break into those groups and don't just stand there by yourself. Look for the open groups and slide in. If you're an introvert, and this is, this is, this is almost contrarian. If you're an introvert, look for the larger group. Hmm. Here's why. You slip into the larger group, you slip in unknown, <laughs> yeah, almost unseen. So it's, you know, it's not like, hi, I'm so-and-so, because, you know, there's a, a group of people. Somebody will eventually ask, oh, you know, who are you? And, and, you know, what's your name? What do you do? But look for open twos, open threes, open groups, not closed twos, closed threes, and closed groups when you walk into a room. That's a good tip for everyone out there, whether you're an introvert or not. Some people have limiting beliefs about starting conversations, about how to fit into groups. So that's really great, Ivan. Something else I'm picking up as we're talking here is that it's not just about the quantity of contacts, it's about the quality of connections. Tell us about quality versus quantity when you're, when you're getting to know someone. So if your network is a mile wide and an inch deep, it will never be very powerful. Your network needs to be both wide and in places deep. That is, have relationships that are deep relationships with uh, some of the people that you're networking with. Uh, you know the old expression, it's not what you know, it's who you know? I don't think it's either. I don't think it's what you know or who you know. It's how well you know each other nice. that really counts. Now, I've got some... I got some amazing contacts in my database. I mean, some amazing people in my phone. The question isn't uh, who's in my database, who's in my phone. The question is, could I pick up the phone and call that person? Would they take my call? And if I ask for a favor, would they be willing to do the favor? That's what counts. And so it's not just who you know, it's how well you know each other that really matters. It's it's that getting to that point of credibility that you're at such a level of credibility that the person's going to absolutely take your call and absolutely help you out if you ask for it. So yeah, absolutely wonderful there, Ivan. And and what I'm hearing there, it's not who you know, it's how well you know them. What I'd like to ask at this point, what do you think the leadership lesson is out there? Because we're talking a lot about business networking and probably about entrepreneurs and business leaders, et cetera. But there's also the team leadership. So if you're in a team leadership position, how important is this? How well you know them? Well, listen, I, you know, I think the one of the things that you have to understand in terms of getting to know people in a, in a in a leadership environment is the core values and the culture of the group that you're talking about. Whenever group, you know, whether you're talking about a BNI chapter, which we have very uh, strong core values as an organization, or whether you're talking about a nonprofit organization, you need to know what the core values and the culture is of that organization because you you lead with the values. And the values may differ. So um, if, if you're in a business and you have not established strong core values that everybody, you could ask any one of your employees and they could tell you what most of the core values are. If you're, if you're not doing that, trust me, your employees are, and they may not be core values that you like. They'll be doing, they'll be coming up with values that just aren't yours or aren't the companies or aren't the organization. And so to be a really good leader, you have to start with um, being a culture champion. And uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Culture is the secret sauce to a successful organization. Uh, if you have a strong organizational culture, you can make a lot of mistakes and still do well. But if you have a strong organizational culture and a strong strategy, you're going to be the industry leader. And so leadership, I think, begins with understanding your core values and, and being the culture champion of that organization. 
So what I'm hearing there is not just understanding those core values, but it being able to articulate them, being able to be able to stand up on a, on a stage or in a group and to be able to be so in touch with your core values that you're able to articulate them with deep clarity. Yeah. But, but not just not just you as the leader, mm. but uh, the people that you are leading. So, for example, in BNI, when we have staff meetings in our state, we have 800 people who work for corporate and uh, 10,000 people globally work for the organization uh, and the franchises and, and elsewhere. When, whenever we have a, a, a global support team meeting, uh, one of the first things we do is we pick somebody to talk about one of the core values. You know, so-and-so, would you talk about one of the seven core values and why it resonates with you? And everybody knows that the CEO might call on them that week to talk about one of the core values. Uh, I think that's really powerful. We talk about core values at BNI meetings. We have videos about core values. We also, one of the things we do, and this is really unique, I think, for an organization, is we do, uh, when we hire a new employee, uh, what we call boot camp. And it's about two weeks long. And you don't even start your job. You don't do the stuff you're supposed to do for the most part. Instead, you're meeting with other employees doing Zoom calls around the world, you're meeting with different departments within the organization to find out, you know, to really get a thorough orientation. And the last piece of boot camp is boot camp final is a conversation with me about the core values and culture of the organization. Those are the kinds of things that you do if you want to maintain and enhance your, your culture of any organization. That's wonderful, Ivan. I love that approach to onboarding. I think there's a lot of organizations out there that are struggling with onboarding at the moment. In fact, they're, they're playing a lot of catch up around being desperate for people. They've got skill shortages, et cetera, et cetera. And they, they end up almost taking anyone on the business, but they haven't done that process of this is who we are. This is what we stand for. These are our values and, and to attract the people that resonate with those values. How, do, how does that sit with you? Absolutely. Well, absolutely. But, it, but once you bring them in, all the more important it is to, to onboard them properly. Yeah. Because, you know, it, it's not easy getting employees right now. And so if you do get them, you want to onboard them in a way that they're like, wow, this, I've never been to a company that did all of this before I started the job. That's really important. Now, as for looking for people, you know, my my philosophy on that has evolved as I've gotten more and more gray hair. My philosophy is be slow to hire, fast to fire. And I, you know, I, I am I I have lost more sleep over people I've kept than people I've let go. And I lose sleep when I let go of people. I don't like to let go of people, but I've lost more sleep over people that I've kept than people I've let go. And, and that's changed over the years. I've, I've come to the conclusion that sometimes it's just not a good fit and it's not going to do either of us any good to keep somebody on, in place. And I feel like there's a connection there that when you say good fit, it's good fit to the culture and good fit to the values. Not, not good fit is are they good at their job? It's, I'm hearing an undertow there. Ivan, that what you're really testing is, are they a good fit for this team? Are they a good fit for this culture? Are they, li yeah. are they living our values? Is that what I'm hearing? Well, that's the most important, uh, you know, because you can teach, you, you can teach skill set to some extent. It's really hard to teach uh, culture, uh, you know, and it's, it's hard to teach attitude. Uh, and we don't have time to send them back home to mom to get retrained in terms of attitude. And so, Attitudes, the harder, hardest of the, of the things to, to, to uh, work with in an employee, you have to have somebody that's got the right attitude to the core values of your organization. Skill set, you know, you can work with that. I've, I've had employees that, so, so I've had employees that were the poster child for ignorance on fire. And I've always felt that ignorance on fire is better than knowledge on ice. Okay, if I've got somebody who's on fire, they're excited. They want to do it. I can teach them what to do. I can teach them how to do it. I know how to delegate effectively. And so if you know how to delegate effectively, you can teach people how to do things if they're, if they're on fire and excited. The worst thing is, is you know, uh, knowledge on ice. When they're, you know, they know what to do, but they just don't care. And there, there's not much you can do with that person. So um, skill set is easier to teach, I think. So I want to play back to you what I'm taking from this, Ivan, and see if I've got it. And that kind of helps as well with kind of 
dotting the I's and crossing the T's on this. So I'm hearing being really clear about your values and being able to communicate them so that you'll attract people that believe in the things that you believe. Be slow to hire then checking for things like, do they believe in those values? Do they have the right attitude? And then having the right rituals so that those values are lived values. They're not an, a set of values on an office plaque wall. They're, they're every meeting I'm hearing from you that you're going, right, who wants to share something about a value today or, or picking people to talk about the values. So it's a living thing that everyone is talking about. It's not just something on the website, yeah. something um, in induction and then forgotten about. Yeah, that last part is really important. The older I get, the less I believe in words and the more I believe in behaviors. And I believe in words. Words are powerful. But I believe in behaviors more than words. Uh, you know, I've seen people spew the words, but not the behave, not, not live the behavior. So, yeah, that last part's critical. You got to walk the talk. Mm-hmm. What I, there's an old saying, I think it was Teddy Roosevelt that said it, uh, what, what you do thunders above your head so loudly I cannot hear the words you speak. Oh, wow. Yeah, actions speak louder than words for sure. I love that from Teddy Roosevelt as well. So what I'm hearing there, and this is something we've spoken on the show about before, so I want to test it with you right now, Ivan, particularly with what you said about losing sleep, about people that you've kept rather than people that you've let go. So we talk here about, when we talk about values, we talk about you get the behaviors that you celebrate and reward and you tolerate. So if you've got the right rituals to celebrate and reward the behaviors that are aligned to the values, great. But if you tolerate behavior that's not consistent with the values, that's going to start having some kind of toxicity in the business. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and I, um, I probably did that for too long in my company. Uh, you know, and one of the reasons I I have conflicting theories and philosophies here, Uh, one, on one hand, I believe that you treat loyalty like royalty and people who've been with you a long time, you know, you, you, you really do what you can to hang on to them. I think over time, I probably hung on to some too long. We, we outgrew them. Um, and, and, and they, you know, sometimes people change their, their, their attitudes change over time. Life happens to them and they get in a, in a dark place and they're not quite the same employee that they were at one time. So there's a balance there. I believe you treat loyalty like royalty. And I also believe that, you know, at some point, if they're not, if they're not doing the job, um, you're going to lose more sleep over keeping them. Yeah. All right. Very good. All right. I want to come back now to visibility, credibility, and profitability. That was a really key one at the start. And I want to start with the the visibility element. You are the chief visionary officer of BNI. How important is vision in all of this? Well, uh, vision is, I think, critical in building a successful business. And it's never too late. Uh, you know, if, if someone's listening to this podcast and they go, well, you know, I've been in business a couple of years. I haven't really thought about this. It's never too late. Uh, and it's never too early. You know, you could be thinking about starting a business next year and um, it's OK to start thinking about what that would look like now. Uh, strength doesn't come from what you can do. It comes from overthinking, overcoming the things that you thought you couldn't. And it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, it's about, uh, I think it's about effort and, and uh, s- setting a big vision for where you want to go as an individual and as a company is, I think, critical. Um, I remember in, this, in June of 1986, so it was a year and a half after I started BNI. Now, remember, I, I had 20 chapters by accident. I didn't, I, I really had, didn't plan on having that many. But once I, said, hey, this is going to be a lot bigger. I started doing my homework. I started creating a vision. And this was before Monsieur Google. So I couldn't get online. This is 1986, right? I had to go to a library, check out books, uh, look at reference books to get populations. Because I wanted to, to, to kind of calculate how many chapters could be and I have someday. This is all about creating vision. Okay. So I sat down and I, and I after a month of doing calculations, I figured that B and I someday might be able to have 10,000 chapters. And I remember saying to a friend of mine, Hey, you know, I think, I think this B and I thing could have 10,000 chapters someday. And he said, well, how many chapters do you have now? Ivan? I said, 30. (laughs) He said, 30, you have 30 and you think you can have 10,000. I said, yeah, actually, I I think I can have 10,000 chapters. And in 2020, December, 2020, B and I crossed the 10,000 chapter mark and, you know, you can't hit a target you're not aiming at. 
Mm. You've got to set targets. You've got to create a big vision. You've got to create that vision with, with a healthy culture underneath it as the foundation. That's the way I believe, at least a couple of the ways that you become a great leader. Okay, so we're seeing a, a North Star, a clear vision that you're trying to aim towards. We're hearing a great culture building up towards working towards that vision. What about purpose? Well, you know, uh, define how you, what you mean by purpose. For me, that would be mission. Yeah. So, yeah, for me, it's the why. It's it's not just uh, I want to have 10,000 chapters. It's why I want to have 10,000. Okay. So you're looking for the why. So um, my why is one word, inspire. I want to inspire people who inspire people. Oh, I, I have always believed that uh, I, as an individual, may not be able to make a world of difference, but I can make a difference in the world. And I do that one person at a time. And when I make a difference for one person, they'll go make a difference for two. And those two will make a difference for four. And those four will make a difference for eight. And those eight will make a difference for 16. And that's how I believe we got to 292,000 members in 76 countries around the world. It's about trying to make a difference and inspire people Mm -hmm. to make a difference. That's my why. I mean, I have a longer story for the why, but, but that's the short version. So what I'm hearing there, uh, Ivan, uh, is very powerful, by the way, is the 10,000 chapters was something to aim towards, something to drive you, something to motivate you. But the why was about multiplication of impact and realizing that this network effect and this referral network effect that you're having is making a difference more than like Ivan Meisner, just like the rest of us, has only given 24 hours in a day. But now there's 292,000 of you. Yeah. Yeah. And some of them are better at, at this than I am. And some of them aren't. And all, all in all, it's just making a huge difference in the world. I mean, we, during the middle of COVID, we passed 12 million referrals in 2021 at the end of COVID uh, 12 million referrals. We generated over 18 billion with a B over 18 billion U S dollars worth of business for our members. Now, just so you know, 18 billion is twice the gross domestic product for the country of Liechtenstein. Yeah. Okay. It's a small country. I know, but still how cool is that? (laughs) We as an organization could generate more than the GDP of a small country. Yeah. That's amazing, Ivan. And congratulations on your success. I probably should have started with that at the very uh, start. I'm I'm in awe of what you've achieved in BNI. And it is through that collection of people that are all working towards something that they think is bigger than themselves and and that ability to have that networked effect to make a positive uh, impact uh, on the world. I want to break that down now, this vision and purpose and being able to articulate who you are and what you do and why you do it for let's say someone that's running their own small business. Let's go, let's go and air con- they're an air conditioning business and they're a member of BNI. How do they embrace this vision, purpose, articulation with deep clarity of who they are and what they do and why they do it? How do they start? Cause your, your vision <coughs> is global and a, a local air conditioning business maybe doesn't start with that. Well, you're correct. But um, I, honestly, that first year or so, I wasn't thinking of a global enterprise. I was thinking of it being in the U.S. Um, I think any business who wants to grow <clears throat> understands the importance of scaling their business, whether they scale it with one office and many employees or they scale it with many offices in different locations. Scaling is still um, the, the, the issue. So once you understand what your core values are, once you um, create that organizational culture, once you train people on that culture, and you need to do that training directly because education is a leaky bucket process. So if you teach somebody your culture and then you rely on them to teach a third person and that third person to teach a fourth person, you're going to lose information from that bucket over time. And that's one of the reasons why I, I think I said this in boot camp final, I do. So I meet with every single employee of global headquarters before they start. Everyone who speaks English, at least. And I do the final. And I think you need to have that uh, personal connection as much as possible. Now, you want to scale your business? I think one of the first things that people need to learn is how to delegate effectively when they scale their business. And I'm going to to share something with you that I never never heard. I didn't hear it in uh, management school. And it's something that I've talked about for a number of years, that when you delegate, 
you have to delegate both responsibility and authority. Mm. What tends to happen is the people delegate responsibility, but not authority. So this is your job. You got to do it. But then they got, they got to keep coming back to you to get approval on stuff. And so that's when you see these small businesses who, they, they, you know, they're so busy working in the business that they're not working on the business, as Michael Gerber would say. They're so working in the business that they're like, geez, it'd be just faster for me to do it myself than to train this person. Yeah. Well, that's not true. It's faster for a while, but not scalable over time. And so what you do is you delegate responsibility. This is your job and authority. Now, you can't delegate 100 percent authority to a learner. So you delegate a percentage of authority. Who knows what it is? 25, 30 percent. Let's say you delegate 30 percent authority. So for the next 30 days, you've got to come to me for these things. OK, then and then you give them you know, 60 percent authority, 70 percent, 80 percent authority, 90 percent authority with somebody who's been with me for a while and they know what they're doing. I would give them up to 95 percent authority. You can make any decision in this job except for these things. And these things were usually some dollar amount. If it hits X number of dollars, you got to come see me. Or if it if it's anything legal, you got to come see me. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, you have authority. And uh, people, you know, I, t- I tell this to people and they're like, well, but they're going to make a mistake. So I say, don't worry about that. They will. <laughs> it's inevitable. But have you not made mistakes? Look, some of the biggest mistakes made in my company, I made. Some of the biggest financial errors made in my company, I made. So to me, that's the tuition to training somebody. And that's how you scale. You scale, at least one of the ways that you scale, you scale by giving both responsibility and authority over time, almost complete authority to people so that you can scale your business, even if it's locally scaling it. Yeah. So on on the scaling part, if you if you always just do everything yourself, you're never going to scale. If you never let let go and you don't trust people to be able to get on and do the job, you will never scale. And John C. Maxwell uses. I know you're a fan of John as well, uh, Ivan. Uses a African proverb all the time. If if you want to go fast, you do it alone. If you want to go far, you go together. Right. So so then this thing about the responsibility and there, there's a lot of people out there, Ivan, that that feel that people don't want accountability. And my experience is that's not true. What people don't want is accountability without empowerment and enablement. So they need the authority to be able to, like you said, they need to be able to have the levers that they need. Uh, Otherwise, you're holding them to account for something that's not in their control. And they need the enablement, the tools, the resources to be able to be successful. Otherwise, you're setting them up for failure. And then the next thing I'm hearing from you, though, is then that there's a continuum that might need to be adaptive depending on how experienced, how, like, are they, do they have their learner plates on versus to their fully autonomous. And there's this scale between, uh, I'm going to say micromanagement through to abdication. And in the middle is some level of you know, authority and empowerment and accountability and autonomy without kind of just let, letting them drown. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, pretty much. I think the, you're right about the empowerment. And I think um, lifelong learners who are successful, who are really working on being successful as humans, as business professionals, they're okay with accountability. Hmm. People who aren't lifelong learners or aren't, aren't really trying to be exceptional, they're just kind of muddling through life. They hate accountability. Absolutely hate it. And, uh, and so you, I recognize that there are, there are really two different sets of people and the, the ones who are champions are, are willing to, to be held accountable if they're empowered, which is what you said. Yeah. And with that, I think they are. And then there's just a group of people that don't want to ever be accountable. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure there's all, all different types of people in the world for, for sure there. And I, I love this uh, continuum that you talk about. And, and by the way, in, in BNI, we call them the people who don't want to be accountable. Minnows, members in name only. Uh, and, and, and there I recommend that we practice, we practice addition by subtraction. Meaning if we want to grow, we got to let some go. And when you let some go, you'll grow. And that comes back to your culture again. Are they, are they fitting into the values and the culture? And if they're not, they're actually detracting. They're not adding. Yeah, I love it. 
five. And let's let's come back to to visibility <clears throat> one more time. So we we touched on this before. People can't buy a product or service that they don't know about. So one of the powers I see in BNI and the referral network is to be able to articulate to people who you are, what you do, and why you do it, so that those referrals can then be your antenna out there. You're, it's almost like a multiplication of your sales and marketing team because now you've got this network of people that know, like, and trust you that when they're out there and they see something and they go, oh, that sounds something that Ivan's business could help with. So, so how, what tips do you have on articulating that? Well, you know, it depends on the kind of network that you're going to. If you're going to a group like BNI where we're meeting every single week, then you've got, a, you've got a lot of time that you can educate people. And so in, a, in the context of a BNI group, which is different than, say, a chamber of commerce, but in the context of like a BNI group, then you have to remember that you're there to train a sales force, not close a sale. So you're teaching people how to refer you, not asking for referrals. Now, there's nothing wrong with asking for referrals in BNI once you've been there for a while and they know you and they trust you. And that's, that's fine. You can ask for referrals. But the key is to teach people how to refer you. And so this is a counterintuitive. But when you go to a group like BNI, what you want to do is be laser specific about the products and services that you have and just talk about one product or service or benefit of a product or service one week. And then the next week, one product or service, the next week, one product or service, so that over the course of a year, you've given almost an hour's worth of content about the kinds of products and services that you have to offer. And so, um, you know, get laser specific if you're in a group like BNI. If you're in a, you know, an organization where you're only meeting monthly and you're not meeting all the same people, it's different. There you want to um, you, you want to make a connection with somebody that you can follow up with and then sit down and have a one to one with. That's, uh, uh, you know, so you treat them differently depending on the kind of group you're in. All right. Very good. So you're not there to sell. You're there to educate. You're there to educate what you're all about one thing at a time. Otherwise, you're going to confuse them and then build that connection with them so that they will be your eyes and ears out there and help you. And and by the way, we're, we're talking a lot about business. I, I feel like what you're talking about, Ivan, is not just about attracting customers. It's also about attracting your team, about yeah. attracting partners. That might be that you're Find the magical partner that you've been looking for all your life. It, uh, but if you're not out there and able to educate people about what you do, um, who you serve, why you do it, et cetera, people can't support you. Right. And people do want to support you, but you need to arm them with the tools to let them. Would you say that's true? I, I think that's absolutely true, especially people that you've been there for, that you've supported. You know, they, they want to reciprocate. They definitely do. All right. Very good. So we've got the visibility. We're building credibility over time through no like, and trust. And then the profitability comes later. And whether that profitability is in business or it's in growing your team or scaling your business, it, it's, it's going to come by working on that visibility and credibility first. I, I really like it. We've spoken a lot about values, Ivan. So I want to get into the values of B&I. And we'll start with the pivotal one for me, which is give us gain. What does giver's gain mean? Well, to me, giver's gain is more than a phrase. It's a way of living one's life. It's a perspective to view and interact with the world. Uh, it's an attitude, not an expectation. And when it's applied properly, it'll change your life. And when it changes enough lives, it'll change the world. It's about helping other people so they will help you in return. So it's seek first to serve and then... Good things will come later is what I'm hearing. Yeah. But I like what you just said about it being applicable to your life. It's not just about business. Correct. Isn't that what, friend, isn't that what friendship's all about? Isn't that what it is. family's all about? It is. And that's one of the reasons why I think BNI has worked as well as it has is that it's all about building the relationships. And when you have the relationships, you want to help each other. Mm. C- coming back to leadership lessons then, how do you think a leader out there, let's say a team leader, senior manager, how do they embrace giver's gain for good effect with the team that they lead? So I, I stumbled into the answer uh, as a very young man um, when I was, uh, I was working at a transportation company in downtown Los Angeles 
It was my first day on the job. The president who hired me <clears throat> was hired kind of to be a hatchet man because the, they needed to clean house. And I was in a new role. So everybody just assumed that I would be you know, setting people up for being fired, which wasn't the case. But they didn't believe, you know, how it is in companies. They just they just thought they'd get fired. So. Uh, my boss wasn't around for three days. My first three days on the job, he wasn't there because he was at uh, Senate hearings and assembly hearings at, in Sacramento. So I'm, I, I'm like, I have no idea what to do. And when the boss comes back, <laughs> if I say I just sat here and looked at the Hollywood sign out of my window, I'd get in trouble. So I had to figure out what to do. So what I did was I walked around. This is the answer to your question. I walked around to each department head and I sat down with them. And at first they were all kind of freaked out because they were worried that, you know, I was setting them up. And I said, just, I'm new. Just tell me what you do and how you do it. And, you know, this is long before the internet, long before, uh, you know, uh, we could just read about it online. So they, they told me what they did. And to a person, what I said to them, and here's the answer to your question. I said, once they explained their department and the challenges they had and what was working, I said, how can I help you? And they said, what? I said, how can I help you? I look, I don't know that I can promise that I can help you. This is a new job for me. But um, I, I, if I know what it is that you need, at least I'm aware of how I might be able to help you. Completely changed their attitude about me. And they didn't view me as somebody who was coming in to get rid of them. They viewed me as someone who was coming in to help them. And that's what a leader does, is they help their team members be successful. There's three things I'm hearing there, Ivan. The first one is in a vacuum of information, people start drawing their own conclusions, right? So here's Ivan, he shows up and their first thing is, oh, he's here to mop up, he's here to fire people because the intentions were not clear. So make your intentions clear. The best way to avoid a vacuum of information like that is to make your intentions clear. The second one, Ivan, is I'm hearing that you asked you ask better questions. You ask the right questions. And the third one was the servant leadership, that I'm here to help you. I'm not here to hinder you. My success is on the back of your success. So I'm here to, I'm here to help you, not hinder you. So give is gain. Uh, and I think there's something in that for all of us as leaders to think about, not just from a B&I and business point of view, give is gain as a, a way to live our lives, the way to lead our teams, and yes, the way to lead our businesses. The second one is building relationships, and I think that we've covered that in quite a lot of depth, Ivan. So I'm going to move, going to move on to the third one, which we did uh, touch on a little bit, but lifelong learning. Tell us more about your approach to lifelong learning. Well, you know, I incorporated it into our core values early on because I realized that we don't teach this in colleges and universities anywhere in the, in the world. We don't teach networking. We don't teach social capital, emotional intelligence. It's just not taught at most universities I mean, mm. emotional intelligence may be a little, but certainly not business networking uh, or, or social capital. It's just not taught. And and so that means we have to we as business people have to learn it on our own. And there are a number of books, some of them mine, some of them by others, like Bob Berg has a great book on networking and Susan Rowan has a great book on networking. And I've got a bunch of net books on networking. And so um, we have to learn how to network effectively. Now, I started it because we didn't, you know, we're not teaching networking. But the truth is, if you want to be a successful business person, you have to be a lifelong learner. You have to learn about leadership and management, and you have to learn about uh, accounting to some extent. You, you got to read a financial statement. Uh, you got to learn about different aspects of, uh, of business and personal life. You know, you're constantly developing yourself as an individual, hopefully. And people who are constantly developing themselves as an individual are, are growing. Uh, the world is changing and we need to stay up on top of it. And to do that, you have to be a lifelong learner. Yeah, the scary part there is the world is changing at a faster rate than it ever has before. But the even scarier part is now slower than it ever will change in the future. So, it, so it's actually increasing in pace in terms of the way we change. So if we're not learning, we're actually going backwards, right? Yeah, ex absolutely right. Yeah. Mm. And a fixed mindset would look at a, a new challenge, something new coming and go, oh, I don't know how to do that. Whereas a growth mindset will go, well, I back myself to learn how to do it. And that takes intentional action to carve out time every day to go, okay, what did I learn today? Yeah, very good. Yeah, and we certainly had to do some learning during COVID, didn't we? 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, look at how much the world's changed in the last three years, right? All right, what about, what about positive attitude? Tell us about why positive attitude is so important to you. Well, I've done a couple of surveys over the years asking what are the top characteristics of a great networker. And in both of the surveys I did, positive attitude showed up in the top three. People want to do business with people who have a positive attitude. And, you know, they, they just don't want to do business with people who are negative. I, I remember there was somebody who visited a chapter, a BNI group, and they said, we don't want this person. I said, why? And they said, well, because he's a fun sucker. He just suns, he just sucks all the fun right out of a room. And so, you know, this is not the kind of person that we want in our group. And so uh, a positive attitude is, I, I think, really important uh, in any kind of organization where you're going to have people getting together. Uh, it, it's people, people complain sometimes as though it's an Olympic event. It's not. I've checked. It's not an Olympic event. And so what you want to surround yourself with are people who are positive and supportive. And who's in your room? Uh, I talk about engines versus anchors. People who drive you forward to be the best version of yourself or people who just drag you down. And you want to surround yourself with engines, and those are positive people. Yeah, so who's in your room? It's it's one I haven't read yet, Ivan, but I I will be reading it. But it's already got me intrigued. And I don't know that we always have a look around at ourselves and do a bit of a check on our our closest friends, our closest yeah. colleagues, etc. You want you want two minutes? You want two minutes on on what who's in your room? All right. Imagine you live in one room, and that one room has one door, and that one door is an enter only door. So that when people come into your life or into your room, they're there forever. You can never get them out. Now, luckily, it's a metaphor, but if it were true, would you be more selective about the people that you've let into your life? Oh, so, so much so. That's what everyone says. And I would argue it's not a metaphor. I would argue that it is, in fact, true. And here's why. I want you to think of somebody that you got out of your life. People say it's a metaphor. You can get them out of your life. Okay, so I want you to think of somebody that you got out of your life. And I want you to think about why you got them out of your life. What was it about them? Were they toxic? Were they difficult? You got somebody? I'm not going to make you name the person. You got somebody in your mind? I do. Okay. I do. All right. Now, I want you to think for a moment about the last thing they did that just ticked you off. You got that? Uh, yeah. All right. So here's the deal. If they're still in your head, they're still in your room and they will oh be my God. for the rest of your life. Oh, you're so true. That is so true, Ivan. It's uh, like uh, just a few questions and it comes to life. Right? There it is. Right. 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 They're there. So Dr. Daniel Amen, who a uh, neuroscientist, uh, he's done a number of PBS specials. He said, the people that you've got a relationship with, a, a professional or personal relationship with, their fingerprints are all over your brain. And so the idea of who's in your room is, uh, you know, you can't get them out of your room because your room starts here and ends here. It, it's your it's your mind. And so um, what we talk about is how do you let the right people into your mind, into your head, into your life? And what do you do with the ones that you let in that maybe you shouldn't have or family members that you had no choice about? And then how do you live the life of your dreams? That's the book. I love it. I'm definitely going to read it uh, probably this weekend coming, Ivan. It sounds amazing. Oh, very good. All right. So I just want to say that it's been such a great pleasure to have you on the show. We're going to go into our our rapid round in a moment. I've learned so much uh, today from this, really thinking about your, your thoughts around vision, your thoughts around relationships, visibility, credibility, profitability around values and making sure that the culture that you have is driven by those values, but they're lived values. They're not just something that you talk about because someone says, oh, you're supposed to have values on the wall. No, it's, it's yeah. those living those values and bringing that culture to life. There's been so many different leadership lessons that have come from today, Ivan. So thank you so much. Thank you. Coming to our- can, can I leave you with one last thought on leadership? Yeah, yeah, please. So leadership to me is about collaborating with the people around you, you know, working with them to achieve something. And if all the people in an organization row in the same direction, that organization can dominate any industry in any market against any competition at any time. And when you are a leader who collaborates with the people in your organization, you will dominate your industry. That's brilliant. Imagine that, the, the power. Once again, coming back to what Ivan said before, that you're, you're only one person but you can multiply your impact by those around you. And then through, I'm going to say purpose alignment, 
having everyone rowing in the same direction, I agree. You'll, yeah. you'll kill any industry and be the market leader if you can get all of that firepower in your team working efficiently and in the same direction with purpose alignment. I, yeah, I love it, Ivan. Brilliant. I'm, I'm so glad that you brought that up. It's, it's a great way to leave that as a, as a thought at the end of uh, our discussion. So the rapid round, um, what's the one thing you know, uh, what's the one thing you know now that you wish you knew when you were 20? I, I think, listen, I spent, I earned all this gray hair, you know, so I, I really, you know, one of my strengths is that I work on things and work on things. I think one of the things I would tell my 20 year old self is just live your values, work hard, live your values. Don't worry so much. Things will work out. And I probably worried more, more than I needed to. Uh, don't worry, live your values, continue to work hard. Things will work out for you. All right, brilliant. Thank you. And what's your favorite book? Well, you know, I've already named it from the business book. That's the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John Maxwell. It's a great book. Um, uh, for a, a personal level, I think uh, Isaac Asimov's Foundation Series. Uh, love that series uh, um, done by Asimov. Uh, really good science fiction. All right, wonderful. And what's your favorite quote? I'll give you a variation of it. Um, it may not be word for word. It's um, Jean-Paul Sartre. We all die too soon or too late, and yet our life is complete at that moment with a line drawn neatly under it, ready for the summing up. We are our deeds in life and little more. Oh, wow. Wow. That's really powerful and something for us to think on every day. Yeah. And finally, uh, Dr. Ivan Meisner, I'm sure the audience have been absolutely enthralled by this. I've certainly learned a lot, as I mentioned. How do people either get in contact with you personally or find out more about BNI? Well, BNI.com uh, is our global website and you can find information on chapters. We have chapters that are meeting online, chapters that are hybrid, uh, you know, one, one time a week in person, three times online. And then we have chapters that are meeting in person all the time, every week. So BNI.com. I'm very active on all the social media, particularly Facebook. You can find, find me on Facebook and IvanMeisner.com, IvanMeisner.com. I've been blogging twice a week for 15 years. So there's a lot of free content up there. You can send a message to me from that blog. Wonderful, Ivan. And I'll add a little thing. And we're going to put all of those links in the show notes, by the way. And I'll add a little personal thing there that I've been to a few BNI uh, chapter meetings. And I was really impressed with the collaboration, with that ability for people to articulate with clarity who they are, what they do, why they do it and to build that visibility and that credibility so that the profitability will come as a result of the relationships that are built. So it absolutely does work. I've seen it with my own eyes. Uh, anyone out there that has thought about BNI, go and try a chapter meeting and you'll see for yourself whether it's for you or not. And I'm going to put money down that you probably will say it is for you because it's a very powerful approach. And it's the, it's the values, it's the referral network, it, everything that they stand for. I'm sure you're going to love it. So once again, Ivan, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciated you taking time out of your day to speak with us and, and our audience today. And we wish you the best of luck as you continue to grow this amazing vision and I'm going to say legacy that you're creating uh, in BNI. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Great interview. Thank you for listening to The Leadership Project at mixbeers.com. A huge call out to Faris Sadek for his video editing of all of our video content and to all of the team at TLP. Joanne goes on, Gerald Calibo and my amazing wife, Say Spears. I could not do this show without you. Don't forget to subscribe to The Leadership Project YouTube channel where we bring you interesting videos each and every week. And you can follow us on social, particularly on LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram. Now, in the meantime, please do take care, look out for each other and join us on this journey as we learn together and lead together.